we today we are going to um, look at how we can use the GemPy library in Python to study uh, structural geology models and generate uh, 3D models. I'm going to walk you through an example that uh, does the following. Uh, initially, we will in, uh, install or rather import some of the basic themes and followed by importing GemPy and other standard libraries. The way GemPy works is that it accepts borehole data where the stratigraphy has been labeled. Structural features like folds and faults are clearly labeled. Then the software or uh, rather the library takes those individual points of uh, different stratigraphy and different structures and tries to generate a three-dimensional model of the subsurface geology. This is uh, very similar to how humans try to think through uh, in the field as they look into the different uh, rock units exposed. So uh, uh, the libraries have been imported. There are some warnings, please ignore them. Uh, that is not important. The way the data is imported is essentially the position of the surface points, the orientation of the stratigraphic unit. Then we draw a grid and then we create surfaces. So for example, a surface would be the contact between two rock units. And then series, what is a series? In this case, we say the series is is this a sedimentary rock? Is this a metamorphic rock? Is this a bedding plane? Is this a cleavage or, uh, you know, and then for faults, we have a very specific uh, series and then any additional data that is there. We use all of this information to generate the 3D model. And typically this data comes in the form of CSV files or Excel spreadsheets. And we are going to take some model uh, basic uh, uh, spreadsheets, which we will uh, discuss during the course in uh, detail. But for the training video, we are just going to accept some the orientation CSV, which means that particular CSV file contains the fault orientations. And uh, this is the output file we are generating. This is the input file we are generating. And based on the CSV files, we generate the model surfaces. What are going to be the model surfaces? The model surfaces is essentially similar to the legend of a geological map. So for example, you can see we have a surface, a rock surf, a unit called shale. We have called it a default series because it's a stratigraphic unit. The order of the surface is one. That means this is the top surface. Then we have sandstone, sandstone, sand, second sandstone. Then there is a fault. Then there is a basement at the very bottom. Okay. Now, this data set that we have now generated, the, the surface set that we have generated is now imported into an, a spreadsheet with its XYZ coordinates. XYZ coordinates are latitude, longitude, or in, an, in plan view, what is the X coordinate, what is the Y coordinate, and the Z coordinate is the depth. Recall that all of these are borehole data. And then the type of surface and some smoothening factor. This is the surface points where the, the surfaces are formed depth wise then we generate the orientations again you can see that for the rock unit we have the xyz coordinate three dimensional position and then we have the orientation okay orientation in space can be described in three uh, three dimensions by uh, this methodology gx gy gz and we label them then once the order is done, we, we have the order, 
we stack them into the stratigraphic sequence in which the things happen. So for example, this stratigraphic column is more important than this one for the simplest reason. This is where we are discussing the order in which the stratigraphic sequence. So the last thing that happened is the faulting. All the stratigraphic units were deposited on the basement in this particular order. So we list that surface again, and we create a stratigraphic series, a new series, which is called the fault series, the stratigraphic series. And if there is erosion or not, if the fault is active, or is this a fault, or is it a finite uh, length or not, and so on. <clears throat> so uh, there are some other uh, things that we kind of see repeatedly. I am not going to skip that because we don't need that information right now. And then we uh, create a grid inside the system to generate these surfaces. Uh, the, all the surfaces are being generated and we are essentially displaying the data so the uh, user is familiar with where is what okay now the fault interface will intersect the stratigraphy at different locations so for all the different boreholes the z or the depth of the fault is going to be different that has to be created the orientation of each of those intersections for at each of the different levels have also going to uh, have to be determined. And then we try to visualize the data in 2D in the first system, where we are going to look at this is Z and this is X. Now, if you look at it, you will see that this is depth. And you will see that the main fault is this color. So the main fault kind of goes like this. Now you will say, how did you get that? Well, the reason we got that, you see these vertical stacks, these are your borehole data, okay, where this green is essentially telling you that that sandstone two that is exposed here, sandstone two is exposed over here on this side as well. So kind of, you are, uh, instead of having lines, you are kind of using these data points to kind of understand where this material is. Okay. This is in the Y direction. Now, obviously you can see that the fault is likely going to be here. If you are not, that is okay. You will see that in three dimensions in a few seconds. So this is the basic plot we have made where we are trying to understand where the rock, different rock units are. Now, uh, we have generated a model. Uh, this is some uh, calculation values that has been generated. It's not important at this point of time. But uh, allow me to show you the direct geometric model that has been generated. Okay. So using those surfaces that we talked about, we create these individual boundaries, okay? Now, once these boundaries are done, then we fill in the boundaries with some color okay. so that you can essentially see that the siltstone is labeled in yellow, the sandstone too is labeled in green and so on and so forth. And the relative displacement immediately gives you what is happening in the cross section. And you can see that this is a normal fault that uh, because the hanging wall has been shoved down. Now you would say that, okay, this is all fancy, uh, but I want to see the exact displacements of the uh, contacts. And, and you can see, you can actually measure the displacements uh, along from this point to this point, because this is a scaled uh, image, you can calculate the displacement along the fault, assuming this is the profile section of the fault. So I uh, generated these uh, values several times. Um, let us now look at the three-dimensional geometry, and then we'll add topography on top. So 
this might take a little bit of time, but this is the 3D visualization of that fault. And I can actually rotate the fault so you can see how this is defined. Okay. The cross section that I showed you is from this view. Okay. Or in other words, you will have, you would have seen that in the top of that picture, it always said along the y direction. That means the y direction is perpendicular to you. That is the y direction. Okay. And you can actually, if I can make this fault to, if this, uh, this 3D image to cooperate with me a little bit. So you can actually see the entire units stacked on top of each other and the fault displacement. And the static graphic column is given here where this blue is the fault that has cut through everything. So this is the power of GemPy where just using borehole data, you can actually generate this. Now, you might not necessarily have borehole data always, but if you have data at different depths or elevations, you can kind of trick the system into thinking that this is borehole data. We would have to organize the data so that it understands it as if it was borehole data. And then we can generate models like this. Now, uh, this, this code is running to generate the, uh, the topography of that. Again, uh, if you have your basic DEM, you can calculate where the uh, what the topography is, and then you can add that topography. So this will take a little bit of time um, uh, for, for it to uh, generate because my computer is a little slow. It, it has uh, already calculated the values. Now I'm waiting for the uh, model to generate in two dimension. And then you can obviously save these models as well. Uh, obviously you want to save this model to kind of show what is going on. And you can save all the uh, data frames uh, that you generated for the different aspects of the model. So it, the, the time that is uh, we're taking is because uh, it's trying to run this 3D model as well. It's always the visualization that takes the most amount of time. So now we have uh, generated the uh, 2D topography on top of our model. And uh, you can see that we have added the topography and erosion as well. Uh, again, uh, the y-axis is perpendicular to the screen, and you are seeing how the topography is uh, included along this direction. Now, a three-dimensional rendition of the same model has also been generated, which is of, uh, shown over here. Again, remember, I have to rotate. See, I am terrible at rotating uh, 3D models. I have to be very careful. See, already it's trying to go the other way. Huh. This is our model. The y-axis is again perpendicular to the screen. And this is the model and this is the topographic surface. So now you can understand that the original 2D stratigraphic sequence that we had generated was not entirely true. So there is a lot of back-end work that had to be done to understand where some of the eroded sequence was before we could generate this model. So in, even in the borehole logs, we had to extrapolate in the eroded regions where these beddings would have been. And this is very easily done by uh, uh, solving three-point problems and extension of the bedding as per the strike and dip of the bedding plate. 
human hair. So therefore, it is possible to generate these kinds of renditions if you have good, good data sets. Having said that, the GemPy library is right now at its infancy. So this relatively simple geometry takes a lot of computational power to generate. And as the uh, computational power uh, improves, as the library matures, the modeling aspect would get much better. So for example, you can observe the pixelation in the contour generation in the three dimensional. So it, it, it's very edgy. Okay, so the, the smoothening has to be played around with, with uh, by the uh, participants. So for example, you can see that the fault surface is corrugated, okay, like, like a stair step. You know, typically that is not the case in real life, but this is a very good rendition in uh, three dimension for a, uh, to be put into a report. Okay. Now, if I turn the, uh, the entire model on its head and look at it in plain, a plan view, such that the Z direction or the depth direction is perpendicular to the screen, you can actually see the different topographic elevations. And you can then observe that the, the intersection of the contour lines with the contact, geological contacts are rather shallow. Therefore, the beds are not steeply dipping, which you already know because you can see that from the 3D model itself. The beds are no more than 5, 10, 50, uh, tops 15 degree a dip. All right. So that is the basic example that